Happy New Year, everyone, and let's make 2023 a year to remember. Many of you will have goals. It could be a big race, sorting out that niggle so you can run pain free again, and maybe a New Year's resolution too. Whatever you are planning, we're so pleased you are taking us along with you. Now, I don't normally make a resolution, but if I did, it would be keep the bar nice and low to guarantee success. Are you one for resolutions, Eddie? Nope. Uh, I did make a few changes to my life style, life in general mm. last year um, that I'm going to carry on working on this year. But I wouldn't say I would like write first of January. This is my resolution. Yeah. I'm going to do this every day. I'm going to I'm going to journal as I was <laughs> joking. <for it. laughs> and he's like, what are you doing? And I was just, I'm journaling. I'm on Instagram, really. Uh, last year. So I'll, I'll share with you this. Last year, I decided that I was going to care a little bit less about what people thought of me and worry a little bit less about, you know, if I do, you know, if I'm like that, if I don't do that, if I don't go to that, will people yep. care? And it was such a waste of emotional energy. And also things like WhatsApp groups that you get, you know, as a mum, if you're listening to this or busy person, you get added to WhatsApp groups. You're like, I, I don't want to be added to that group. Yeah. Don't, I'm not going to that thing. I just want to leave it. And before, Eddie before would have been like, I can't, that's rude. Or I, I've got to go to this thing because I've been invited and I've got to go. And I'd be like, but I don't really want to go. I'm actually, though I know I come across in the podcast as loud and I'm actually quite, I'm not shy, but I don't actually really like big social situations, social things. It's, I almost, and I think it's as I've got older, I find it just too, too many people. It's too much and I don't enjoy it. So last year I was like, do you know what? I don't enjoy that sort of thing. So I'm going to step away from it and I'm going to, to say no if I don't want to do something or if somebody asks me to do something that I don't want to do instead of saying yes straight away I'm going to protect myself I guess a little bit and yeah. go no and the same with like lots of like social like whatsapp groups I'm like I don't want to be part of this so I'm going to just not be rude but I'm just going to move away and I'm going to do my I'm going to do my life if people want to join me <laughs> In yeah. this. And I think that had a lot to do with a lot with spine training as well. It's taken so much focus and brain space and physical, like it's got to be, it's all had to be so regimented that actually it's kind of worked hand in hand in that I've kind of moved myself off from things that took energy that didn't really need to take energy. Basically, yeah. I realize I can't really explain it because it's a bit, but probably people are nodding a little bit, hopefully and going, yeah, you know, we, we sort of feel that we have to do all this stuff all the time. And we don't, we need to be, so I like it. Take, taking from that, my other thing was I read somewhere that this, uh, this retired guy was saying, I'm going to go down, walk down to town to buy an envelope. And his wife said, why are you walking down to town to buy an envelope? You could just order a pack of envelopes and then you don't need to go and buy an envelope every week. And he's like, it's not the envelope. It's the process walking down to town having some time by myself, going into the shop, buying the envelope, talking to people in the shop, and then going and posting whatever he was he posted every week and then coming home. It's like, I was like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that that we don't do anymore because we feel we should be doing, if we're not achieving stuff all day, that I love what, like when Bryn's parents come, they walk down to town and they go and buy paper every day. And it's like, we'd never do stuff like that because we'd be like, we've got to go, go, go. <clears throat> So after the spine, I'm going to add a little bit more envelope Ooh. trips into my life and just take more time, not worry if like the afternoon is not fully scheduled and the kids and I just be and just be. I, I very rarely do things I don't want to do, maybe, but unless somebody's particularly reaching out for some help, then... Um... Oh, obviously, if someone oh. said, Eddie, can you help? I would be like, yeah, but I was finding myself going deep into things, places, doing stuff and rushing around doing stuff that I wasn't really super keen on doing. So I yeah. was just sort of like, no, I'm going to protect. And yes, it's meant I've missed, I've become a little bit more of a hermit and I've probably missed out on social stuff. But do you really miss out? Do you really? I want to be outside. I want to be in the mountains. I'm really happy just being with my family. Uh, Bryn did say you need to get out a bit more off the spine. <laughs> anyway, hi everybody. We ra rambled. Welcome to episode five of Tea and Trails. And this week's guest is Tom Hollins. Tom flies under the radar a little bit, but do a little bit of digging. And he is a prolific performer and athlete. He's recently climbed a vertical marathon, which was 223 reps of Pendle Hill. Oh my gosh, 193.29 miles, 138,706 yeah. feet, 
of a <clears throat> vertical ascent, which is 26.27 miles. And it took him, gosh, it took him 112 hours and five minutes. It's quite fitting we talked to him about elevation because this week with A Brew With The Coaches, we talk about uh, how to fit elevation training if you're doing a hilly race into your plan and also a little bit about incorporating strength training into that too. Last but not least, we bring you this week's Tales and Trails. Got lots of business, lots of business over on the Facebook group. Gary's been riling you all up. Oh, yeah. The races <laughs> and things. Uh, so we'll hit on to that later. Uh, but it's great to see that little bit of um, the podcast expanding. I love it. I like the tales from the trails. You know, I initially visualized that people would email in um, and stuff like that, maybe message me. But yeah, I'm kind of casting my net. Also, we should say, Gary, casting your net, you old sandbagger, you. <sighs> I don't like it. I got really nervous. So I hadn't heard his all his little bits of commentary. Commentary? Um, people's feedback from the Tour de Velen race until I actually listened to the podcast live. I got a live recording. <laughs> and you were amazing. You were amazing. Everyone that was on it was really, really good. And you were, you were like, you were professional. I, mean, I was a bit sensitive. I, yeah, thanks for that. I appreciate that. I was super nervous. I didn't ask you if you listened to it because I was scared for the feedback. <laughs> I don't know why. No, you don't but, get the truth, Gary. <laughs> I was super critical. Uh, sometimes I didn't uh, didn't react to somebody's answer. Maybe I should have picked on that more. Um, and I found sometimes because I was asking the same questions to half a dozen no, people. I thought you asked loads. Of, like it was really very, you asked the same questions, which were good. And you asked varied questions. Who was really good. Definitely. And as I said to you earlier, what I really, I also really loved was hearing all the noise in the background yeah. of all the race, post-race chitter chat. I could yeah. literally hear the teacups clanging. So it worked really well having course knowledge. Mm, yeah, you having done it, you got a bit more respect, I think, from your fellow racers. <laughs> so any race directors out there that want to give Gary a free race and then he'll come and interview the competitors, he's yeah. fully available. Well, I'm fully available too, but I'm not so keen on the flight. So, Gary, we're sitting here. I can't see the muscles popping out of your shirt. <laughs> so what's been happening well, talk about New Year's resolutions. Yeah, I'm that classic. Um, although I did join before the first of Jan. Um, yeah, I still go to the gym, and it became very apparent the last time I went to the gym, and I maybe didn't really um, appreciate that you should do your hard running sessions before you lift heavy down the gym. I think I, I was a bit relaxed about that, and uh, yeah. If I was going to do a quality session last week, um, I didn't really do any quality sessions again because I've got a sting cold. I 100% could not do a hard session after where my hamstrings and legs felt after the, uh, the when, when I went to the gym. And also, you know, ultra runners have this classic um, ability to think more is more, more is better. And if you want to be a better runner, I don't really think you could do three at a push but you couldn't do more than that. Three, I think, is probably even a stretch. Two, to fit in with quality sessions, you could, you shouldn't really do much more than that. Otherwise, your running, I think, will suffer because you're just not going to recover in time. If you're doing bodyweight exercises, fair enough, I think you can get away with it. But then there's a limit to how far you can go with that. If you're lifting heavy, as I'm experiencing, maybe it's just because I'm refreshing my body um, as far I, as that When comes. I listen back, and now I've got some inside knowledge because I have actually listened to podcasts rather than just <laughs> sweating over what was coming next. But yeah, definitely two sessions. Also, if you use the machines over the free weights, because you've got that support with the machines, you can push more than perhaps you're ready to push as well. Yeah. So you might have been sore because you were pushing quite big. Well, you were trying to keep up with Tiny Tim as well, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so you might be sore. But also, within a few weeks, you're not going to have that soreness. Yeah. You might have residual tiredness. You know, although it's not structure, it was still, I looked at my Strava because everyone's year-end reviews were popping up. But I saw I'd still do 58 miles. 12 hours of exercise and about just under 5,000 feet of elevation. So man, I'll take, that's not a bad way. Well, it's interesting talking about the year end reviews. I'm sure I saw Killian Johnny did a big uh, Facebook post. And I think he said he did 900 hours. of. Yeah, I think I was about 500, 600 hours. Yeah, I was just over 600. Um, but I, to be fair, I thought it would have been more for a full-time athlete in, if you kind of, put everything under the umbrella and added it all up. But uh, yeah, still performing at a massive level. I had a bit of a hangover, New Year's Day hangover. Stop it. Did you party, party, party? Well, I partied playing board games. Um, 
I, yeah, I just drank a bit too much. We had a bit of drink with my meal. Went out in Durham in the afternoon. That was nice. I um, had a bit of drink there. Then I think I had six six beers in the evening. A few a few proseccos. I know. Yeah, I woke up oh and just thought, God. this is not this is not good for me. But we Did that decide twenty twenty three was going to start the second of January. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm doing unofficially. I'm doing these red things. Um, so run every day December. I did that. It was relatively easy for someone like probably like yourself or me because I do run every day. So um, it's not. But it's nice to support stuff like that. Um, it's good. And we had this. I don't know if you've ever if it's made to France, but in England there's a thing called ding dong dim sum, and it's um. It's like a like a Hello Fresh, I suppose that kind of the, the, you know these meals that you get sent out to you. Only you don't really you prep it, you don't cook it, uh, you don't kind of uh, do that. You just kind of heat the elements up, and it's really really lovely dim sum boxes. So we had a, a vegetarian vegan dim sum on Sunday on New Year's Eve. So that was awesome. Went to see Matilda yesterday with the cinema. Oh, I did love it. So I've watched it. It went on Netflix. No, no, no. Well, is it Netflix or it's the singer? It's the, the musical. musical. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I didn't realise it was on Netflix, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we've wasted a cinema trip. But yeah, we watched it. The whole family watched it. Bryn even managed to stay awake and yeah. for, for a half of it. <laughs> and now, yeah, and I can hear Evie upstairs singing all the songs and while oh, she's in her little pottering in her bedroom. I thought I was guaranteed to sleep. I thought, yeah, get in. Yeah. I've got two hours here. And I was just hooked. It was awesome. I the loved. kids love it because especially the ones that are into like the am drams because they see the other kids doing that. One, I think they realised <laughs> they were not as good as we thought we were at singing. They see the other kids and then they're, they're like, so how does that work that they're like, will they have had to go to school and be doing like, they're just minds are blown. And they're yeah. like, and Finney's like, would they get paid? And I was like, yeah, they would have got paid. Because I was an extra in a film when I was at school, when they needed school kids. And I remember we got paid £25 a day. Yeah, we didn't do anything. We just ate cheese sandwiches out of the catering truck yeah. and messed around with the guys on the cameras. And I remember twenty five pounds. So that was what thirty years ago was a. I always remember That's that was big dollars. Yeah. And I was so outraged because my dad made me pay. It made me give him some money for petrol because he had to drive me over to this school where it was being. It's a lesson. Anyway, I told my I told Finney that I was like, and I reckon some of the kid the kids will have been paid good thousands of pounds for just being extras at dancing, and I could see Finney's eyes going. The ding, the ching. Yeah, if you've got kids, or even if you've not got kids, it's a great everybody. Everybody enjoyed that catchy songs, annoying kids. Well, it seems like quite a busy week, actually. You know, a lot of quite a few miles and uh, lots of family time. It's just a pretty full, wholesome, and rich week. I really enjoyed it. But now, yeah, it's like kind of casting an eye going back to work, which is a, which is a bit miserable. But yeah, what about yourself? I bet you've had an action packed week. Oh, that night going back to work, we had to watch. Oh, we watched. Um, oh, I've told you a lot about films rather than running. We watched Where the Crawdads Sing. Have you watched that yet? Oh, well, that really rings oh, the bell, actually. Good. The book, I've had the book and I've been too scared to read it because I've been scared that it's scary. It's not scary. Yeah. So we watched the film. So we watched that the night before Bryn had to go back to work because we were he was getting a bit low that the diet, the bell was tolling Please. and it was all over. Uh, we didn't do it. We had like a lovely family New Year's Eve. The kids were skiing, obviously, until late in the evening. And we didn't. They, they were like, can we stay up till midnight? I was like, sure, yep. do it. <laughs> I will be in bed. And they were all asleep by half past eight. Um <laughs> I just felt a bit flat last week. I think it was the post Christmas everything and the the taper. Like I just have. To, I mean, there's just anybody that knows going into a big race, something you've you've worked the ball of fear and sickness in my stomach just oh. grows every day. And yeah. every run I'm doing, I just feel I just don't feel very good. And I'm just like, I can't do it. I can't in my head on the runs. So I'm like, oh yeah, I can't do it. I can't do it. It's too far. My hour run today, I was like, I can't. It's too far. An hour is enough. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I did my last long run, um, and I all our snow has gone, Gary. Literally, they oh. closed the resort. The kids aren't allowed to ski anymore because there's no snow left. And so I did my last. Um, long four hour run a couple of days ago. It was so hot. Oh, I chaffed all down my back, which I haven't done for months because you know, because I haven't talked about it. But I was sweating. I had like my full spine kit on. Yeah. It just, I didn't even think about it. And then I went out and I was like, oh my God, it's so hot. I got so dehydrated and my back chaffed, which annoyed me. But I did, yeah, four hours and I did a lot of running normally. I didn't do as much climbing as I normally did. And I did feel, I was like, after 20 miles, I was like, oh my God. 
<laughs> I met the kids in a burger place. We timed, I literally finished, walked in as they presented me with my plate of curly fries. And I just, oh, I just like put ketchup all over them. And I was like, oh, Bryn, I'm not that hungry. And then I went, oh, <laughs> <laughs> he was like, you're not that hungry. Uh, it was great. I loved it. Um, so I've done, that's done. I've still got, I've got a two hour long run this week to do i'm going to do that tomorrow with the pack and i'm going to do a four hour walk at some point this week um just to keep moving keep the devil yes, big days off while i was still big isn't it oh it's nothing gary when you've been out with a pack for like 10 hours and it's only that'll be walking that won't be running it's important to keep moving for me it's important to keep moving because i'm used to doing 20 hours a week so this week will be about 12 yeah very low impact and keep moving both physically and mentally as well because that the fear i'm just waking up in the night like the fear is big of and i don't can't even put my finger on what the fear is i think the biggest fear is not finishing and yeah. just and not even getting to 50 miles <laughs> it's a super big scary um goal isn't it and i'm just trying yeah so yesterday i got out all my ziploc bags and i started prepping all my food for all the checkpoints so we have to have three thousand calories um which is pretty easy to you i've got two precision hydration gels of yeah. the 90 grams that they have each have about 300 in for each leg i reckon two i don't think i'm going to want more than that because i probably will just take one like every four out to mix it all up so I'm good. Okay. Yeah. i've got different <laughs> varieties of flapjacks and bars i've got tailwind to drink um I've got some sweets. And then when I get over to England, I'll top it up. Lion bars, ovs. Um, and then I'll top it up with like fruit, a real mixture. Bryn was like savory stuff. And I was like, I don't think I ever eat savory stuff. I'll make some sandwiches. I love a sandwich. And I've got some expedition meals as well for like oh, yeah, some, yeah. At some, the bigger long. So if I get any hot water. It got mega so calories. Where there's, yeah, where there's halfway checkpoints, quick ones, I will down a mac and cheese as you do. <laughs> <laughs> it would be good to throw in some curveballs. Brim makes a good point. I, I remember my heart was 110 at the last minute. I just said to Lisa, but I think Melissa just did it. Pop some rice puddings in there. Yeah. And it's nothing I've ever yeah. used before, and I smashed them. Yeah, I reckon Bryn was, but like you need, and I was like, I'll just the thing, I'll eat anything. I'm not fussy. I can eat anything. I will eat anything. So any, literally, anyone standing on the trail, I will just eat what you put out in your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I've ordered my veggie burger from Nikki's Bar, which is about 50k in, and awesome. I'm just so I'm just going to focus on getting there the first day. I'm going to like. That's going to be, and then when That's I a little win, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll deal with the rest of the race. So yeah, I'm just I'm in a I'm in that terrible place where I'm just like there's too much thinking, not enough doing, and this time next week I'll be almost on my way. So I mm. reckon, and everything will be packed and everything will be sorted, and it's kind of like countdown. This week I think the week week the pre week week is the worst time for any big event. This week's brew with the coaches. We have a question from a Patreon member, Mike Hall, and he's training for the Lake 100. And he'd like to know when to introduce or up the elevation. And also we touch on strength training too. I'm looking forward to this uh, answer because I've tried to get some information about strength training from Eddie, but it's not really, <laughs> it's not coming out. <laughs> But Mike Hall is training for the Lake 100 and possibly UTS. UTS May and then Lake 100 yeah. July. Oh, my goodness me. So when should I ramp up the elevation? And also, how often should I do strength training? And what training? Do you know any good YouTube sessions? Thanks, guys. And also, I'd like to add, for me personally, it's always a bit of a mystery. How does the strength training play a part during your taper? Of the run lots of information out there regarding running and how that comes in but as far as the strength training side of things so quite a lot of things to answer there should actually we, should we break that down mike because yeah. you're basically asking us to write your training plan <laughs> and uh and well, you're your member <laughs> yeah mike okay we give you we give patrons everything so let's maybe focus first on basically you're asking when you want to ramp up the elevation yes. in your training when you're looking for a hilly race so let's concentrate on that first so you're asking when do i get specific Basically, when do I hit the mountains? And we've got the mountain guy to answer <laughs> this. He's there. He's ready. Russell, how would you tackle that? So great question. Um, obviously, the UTS goes right through my town, Blind Stinio, where I live right now. So I know the course really well. 
Um, Mike, he knows the course well. I know the course really well. Uh, I just got to say, Mike, there is, unfortunately, there is not a gym that is going to prepare you fully for the UTS. And so we, there are things that you can do, and Eddie would probably be better than me at S&C on this, but you're going to have to get yourself out here because if you come across some of the terrain in Snowdonia and you, you haven't seen it before and you're in race conditions... You, you might shit your pants. Like, I don't know if you've been out here before, but certainly there's two areas I would say. Penehalgadi, which means the head of the black dog, um, it's a down scramble. And so I'm pretty sure Eddie and Trish, uh, I don't know about Gary, maybe been on down scrambles before, but they're scary if you haven't done it before. And it's not about strength in your legs. It's about coordination. It's about exposure. It's about moving safely over that terrain. And the other one is Nantri Ridge. You're doing that at night, Mike. And that is really dangerous. Like, you can fall off and die if you get that wrong. Mike um, just asked, sorry. when should he up his elevation? <laughs> you know? Um, what, the answer is, it's not just about elevation for you. Uh, elevation is a part of it. But if you set your treadmill to 10% and run on it for two hours, you'll get the elevation. But you won't get that terrain. You're just not going to be prepared for it. Unfortunately, the, the elevation comes with some really gnarly terrain in UTS. It's unfortunate that the, they're the wrong way around, really. I would do Lakeland and then UTS, so you could just contact the organizers <laughs> and get them to swap around, because I'd say UTS is going to be the harder challenge for you, and it's yeah. coming up first. Um, Nantri Ridge, in the dark, you need to get yourself onto Nantri Ridge and, and find a way to get up here and do a recce. That, that comes before all the elevation training, unfortunately, for me, it trumps that because it is a safety issue. It's not something you want to do for the first time. So being comfortable moving in mountainous terrain to you, you'd build on that. In the dark. dark. In the dark. Do yeah. it in the light first, let's say. Yeah. It's not encouraged, but just go straight up in the dark. But getting people moving in that technical terrain. But then Lakeland 100, not technical really at all, of what we would call mountain technical. So would you be able to ramp that elevation up? Would you? I mean, I know you did a lot of your training for Dragon's Back as well on the treadmill presumably you did yes you can yeah if it's like um more like trail you know like lake districts you know not nearly as hardcore and exciting and glamorous as snowdonia over here but you know <laughs> the, you can it's and suburbia um, as we call the people, lake district yeah <laughs> killian journey does it john alban does it um jim man and <clears throat> quite importantly me <laughs> training on the treadmill Putting the elevation up, it will fire the right muscles. Um, it's actually really, really useful. But then you don't get the down, um, you know, that eccentric load, which can cause more doms than the up um, for some people because that impacts, you know, you're getting more forces of gravity coming up through the legs. So you're not going to get that training on a treadmill. So, you, yeah, you, you, can, you can do the best with what you've got, you know, and um, I would suggest kettlebells are really good and the elevation of the treadmill, but you really need to, um, when you can, the best advice, these are big goals, you know, so treat them with respect and, and get out here and do the reccees. How far out from the race would you specifically say people start focusing on elevation over anything else, Russell? So for, for me personally, I would say for these goals, you want to be looking at, yeah, three months at least. I would say I would say twelve week program. Um, you know, if you could get a recce in at least once a month, but probably more like once a fortnight. I don't know about you guys, but I'd probably have you on a twelve week something like that kind of a specific program. Trish, what about you? You've got lots of history as hilly uh, as a hilly um, mountain runner as well. How do you look at building your elevation? It's difficult because I don't um, I don't live in a in a hilly area either. I live in a very flat area so I, I totally relate there in terms of um you know getting the elevation in but like like russell said it, you've got to you've got to get used to running over that terrain you've got to be comfortable on it i think you need to be consistent throughout um, with it all i don't think in the spe specificity stage for me is about spending lots of time in the hills on that terrain you know really really going for it but i, I still want that consistency in the elevation throughout and i want to be building on that so for me that looks like you know maybe depending on like 
things with the kids and you know commitments and stuff like that that might look in the one in a block i'll go away i'll do a long weekend a back-to-back weekend with friends um you know easy running but over that kind of technical terrain uh, so i think it's really important to stay to get it in to get that in at least once in one training block you've got to get i would say you know Again, depending on what type of race you're doing, you might not need to do a back to uh, a back to back, depending on the race that you're doing. But you definitely do need to be getting away on the weekends and trying to, to get used to running over that technical terrain, being comfortable with it. So I would say continue, stay constant with it, and then in your uh, specificity, like Russell was saying, you, that's when you want to be really kind of all in. There are lots of things you can do straight from conditioning wise to help with making sure your legs are ready for hills. In fact, there's lots of athletes who have done well um, and and live in flat areas who have have, have done well um, running in sky races, for example. I can't remember his name, but there's an athlete in Holland that springs to mind who did bulk his training in a gym and on a treadmill now obviously these guys are like exceptions to the rules majority of time but it can be done so i would say concentrate on trying to stay consistent get this when your specificity stage comes in you want to be um increasing it but you still need that background otherwise you're going to get an injury on your specificity phase because you're going to be too too much you're going to trip over you're going to you're gonna die, like Russell said. <laughs> you're not. You're not. You're not gonna die. You're not. You're not gonna die. Wow. Well. Totally fine. <laughs> I would, yeah, I think um, we touched on some good points there. If you were coming to me, Mike, for training, uh, the first thing I would say before we do, before we look at elevation or anything is to make you the most robust athlete that we can. Strengthen your weaknesses and that's when we can introduce strength and conditioning. You don't want to introduce strength and conditioning 12 weeks out as you start to look at um, really going into the depths of your training program. You want to be looking like you, like you've asked us this question now. We've got six months. This is when you should be going in the gym and working working on your weaknesses. So then when it comes to upping the elevation, you're strong, you know, you've worked and there's heaps of stuff that you can do in the gym. You've got not only things like step ups and boxes now that most gyms have, they have a much bigger free weight area, step up, set down, working that eccentric and concentric muscle movement. Mm. Also got Bozo balls, which are hideously expensive to buy. So it's worth getting a gym membership just to do them, but doing all your exercises on Bozo balls. So your ankles are constantly moving because that's one of the big things is if you're not, if you're used to running on pavements and roads, it's that, it's that proprioception of the ankles and the, the quickness of the brain to the, to the legs, the coordination. When you see someone that's comfortable moving over technical terrain it's just the brain is able to tell the muscles to move quickly and it's just practice so i'd say the first thing is make yourself get work on your fitness work on your robust strengthness and then get more specific as as both trish and russell said and i would focus both of those races purely on i wouldn't worry about distance i'd be all about elevation as much climbing as you can and if you go into it fit and then you work on the elevation you're going to carry that fitness through and time on the course as much time on both those courses and as UTS comes first I'd spend my time hanging out with Russell um, and getting comfortable on that train because that's going to transfer so well to Lakeland when you get to Lakeland and you've got a few rocks to step over you'll be like six minute miling past Gary Uh, uh, so yeah there's heaps of coffee's a V50 I'm not letting him pass coffee's a V50 he'll be flying Um, so incorporating strength training and running is like a is is a tricky and that is when sorry Mike you do need a coach to be able to write a program as well as then running because the the running does need to take a little bit of a backseat when you introduce um, strength and conditioning especially if you're looking at when I'm talking about strength and conditioning I'm not talking about like daily core work that we should all do <laughs> um, <you> know, body <laughs> weight stuff that's just a general part of the, the program strength and conditioning I'm I'm like weight we're looking at weights and we're looking at making you uh, a stronger athlete so now's the time anybody listening december january if you're looking at summer goals now's the time to be upping your getting asking for a gym membership for christmas rather than a new jumper get a gym membership and if you're not sure about how to use weights how to incorporate the program and you can't afford a coach just go along to the gym find a hot personal trainer and get them to uh get them to write you a program get them to show you the machines there's no like it's super easy actually if you know how to write the machines 
to work out a sort of plan in your head once you're comfortable in the gym that I understand it's quite intimidating sometimes going to a gym if you've not been before you need basically you're looking at a push exercise and a pull exercise for legs and for upper body uh so and then as much single leg work as you can do especially if you're doing a mountain race as well you want to have ankles of steel you want to have really good balance um so as much single work as you can incorporate add in a bit of core add in they've got those heavy balls just fling them around the gym a bit um uh, and that's when uh that's why uh that's when you want to incorporate it it's this time of year going into tapering i mean really your work's done like two to three weeks out, you keep that air, you keep that thread of strength and conditioning going through because the muscles that you want to keep loading the muscles. So reminding them that they've got a job to do, but you're not going to get any strength gains there. But I would always keep a gym element in my plan up until really like the week before. I would even go to the gym the week before, but I would just be like, okay, I'm going to do half the program. I'm going to do half the weights. I'm just going to remind the muscles. If anything, for the mental just keeping that routine as well um, and having some time to also work on a bit of mobilization. Do you know any YouTube videos for? Well, I follow, uh, well, be, I've just joined the gym, so I'm like, listen, have listen to this. Have you been to the gym? <laughs> no, he's been to the gym. <laughs> still hasn't been to the gym. <laughs> but he's oh joined. Oh my God. By the same this goes, I will, I will have been to the gym. But whatever, whatever. I, I followed along. Man, Gary. <laughs> But maybe, goodness me, it could be about six, seven years. I've followed along a YouTube channel called Fitness Blender. And they it's almost like you're in a class. And it's been awesome for myself. Just workouts at home. I know uh, uh, people are struggling with, um, you know, like, gym memberships and stuff like that. And we, we, can't do, we can't do everything. Like, one of the things that normally goes with runners straight away is it, once, once the mileage goes up is strength and conditioning. And one of the tips, one of the things that I do is um, I make it, I have a 10, 15 minute routine that I do at the end of my easy runs. Now with, with strength, with strength training in particular, it, it's the recommendation is that you do it. If you're going to go for optimum is that you do it on your hard days to ensure that your hard days are hard. But actually now studies tend to suggest that consistency wins over you know, a couple of times. So if you're doing something less, but you're consistent with it, that builds over time as opposed to just doing a couple here, there, willy nilly. Even if it's 10, 15 minutes, which I mean, I've got a routine. I do the same routine pretty much all the time. I only alternate a few pieces in it. But, um, you know, I don't need a gym for that. I've got weights. It's It has push-pull, it's squats with weights, and I do step-ups on my stairs. You know, so, you know, yeah. you don't need a gym. You can do all of this stuff with 10, 15 minutes at the end of your easy run, and that will build the consistency that you need. So it, you don't have to go to a gym, but there's so much there's so much stuff you can do. I'd say the key thing is just staying consistent and increasing the load. And studies also show now that as you get closer to um, your specificity stage, there are added benefits to increasing load. So increasing your load quite a bit. Um, but that's that's something to bear in mind as well. Um, but again, a coach would be able to give you a proper a proper idea of what that might look like for you. But I would say if you're if you're struggling with it, you can't go to a gym, concentrate on consistency, yeah. 10, 15 minutes after every easy run, and you'll be that'll that'll really help. Yeah, I agree. That's actually what I do as well, Trish. And um, then you, you then you save all the time it takes to go. To yeah, gym. yeah. Going to the gym is a time zapper. Mm -hmm. I always run to and from the gym. That's good. And again, they found that actually running up that um, weight bearing after being to the gym um, uh, tells the brain to repair its muscles. The actual mm. pounding oh, of the okay. run. Whether any yeah. of this is true, uh, yeah. And Trish, I totally agree. Lots of clients they can't, they've got kids or they've got a busy job, and so 10 15 minutes, and you can mix it up. Fill your rucksack with some flour. Lift a child above your head. Use your house. Use your coffee <laughs> table. Use your use your bands. Do you like um, you can be really imag imaginative. Something is better than nothing. Oh, I forgot to say. My uh, my Seth Cardos is great YouTube. He does like eight minutes, ten minutes, little short follow along videos on cool. all sorts of things. Seth uh, Cardos. Seth Cardos. You too. You need to. Yeah, he's okay. great.
to give his like eight to 10 minutes and he just does it and you just follow along. So I do that like when I'm doing, uh, cooking the kids tea. Mike, good luck. Let us know. Let us know. Shout Russell up if you need a guided tour. You go, Mike. Sounds like he yeah. loves it. Nancy Ridge. Uh, Check that one. Let us know. Uh, let us know as well if you need any, uh, you've got three coaches here that are like, I'd love to get hold of you and work you through those two races. <laughs> Our interview this week is with Tom Hollins. What a guy, lots of races under his belt, lots of mountain experience. Um, and we hadn't, but when we were prepping to record him, we, he's quite a stealth on social media, no other podcast. So hopefully nobody else will have heard him talk about his life and running and his different races and his amazing uh, vertical climbing. So here is our episode with Tom. Hi, Tom. Thanks for coming on the Tea and Trails podcast, and thanks for giving us some time today. First time on the podcast, could you share with us uh, your background as a runner? I know that's a massive question, um, so <laughs> yeah, share with us as much as you want. <laughs> Hi, Gary. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm quite old, so I've done a few bits and pieces, but to be fair, I didn't really start until too late. I like ultramarathon running. I like challenges probably more than events. So I like setting up things, seeing what the boundaries are, seeing what I can push. I have won a couple of races. So won the Spine Race from the Spine Challenger, um, York Street Peaks Ultra. Um, but the things I've really enjoyed doing have been more the kind of local challenges, as I said. So the Wainwrights round, I've really loved that. It wasn't the fastest ever Wainwrights, but boy, the weather was terrible. <laughs> so that, I think that was one of my best achievements, finishing that off. Doing the Yorkshire 30 Mountains round uh, around locally, that's always been a good one. Uh, and then, of course, I just did a, a vertical marathon last October. Has it always been trails, though? You know, a lot of our listeners come on, they may have hit the, been to the 10Ks, road marathons, etc. And then they've gone long and then found the trails. Oh, no, interesting. No, I have never, ever done a road race of any kind. Ah. Uh, so I uh, trained in Manchester. I'm a doctor as well. Trained in Manchester. Had no interest in running whatsoever whilst I was living in a city. Came to Yorkshire, just got into hill walking, yeah. and then just thought, oh, what can I do with this? Uh, and I decided one day to do, um, I think it was Yorkshire Three Peaks. There was a British Heart Foundation challenge on. Uh, and I thought, I'll just try running round. And to me, you know, like fell runners were always just absolute nutters. You'd never even think of saying I would be a fell runner. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I kind of ran round. And by the time I got to Ingleborough, they hadn't yet set up the checkpoint. Ooh. And I thought, oh, this is a bit interesting. And then when I finished, I thought, oh, okay. And so I looked at the Yorkshire Three Peaks results and I was like, oh, wow, I'd have come like halfway down the field running around like that. So I thought maybe I should actually give this a bit of a try. Oh, wow. So, but no, never, ever touched a road. And if there's an ultra involving tarmac, I try and avoid it if at all possible. <laughs> well, that was going to be one of my questions. Um, when did you realize you were pretty good at this? Um, yeah, do you know, that's a good question. And I'm not really sure of the answer to that, actually, Gary. Yeah. So actually, there's a series of races called the Ten Peaks. So they have like a shore, a long, and they did do an extreme at one point. Uh, and I think the first time I realized I might actually be pretty good at this was I did the Ten Peaks long course and yeah. won that. And that was an absolute shocker to me. And I thought, oh, well, I'm never going to win a race again. So that's, you know, that's going to be it. I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to rest on those laurels. Uh, but I thought, oh, obviously I'm better at distance than I am at shorter distances. And I think after that, so I looked at the, I looked at the Spine Challenger um, finishing times and I'd never won, I'd never run that distance before. But I just thought, looks like I should be able to do that within that time. And being a Yorkshireman, I thought, well, I would quite like to enter the spine race, but I don't really want to pay for it. So I'm going to, I'm going to try, I'm going to try the challenger, see if I can win the challenger having just won a race. Yeah. And I want that one. And then when I did the, the actual spine race, I was just excited to be there running with the front guys. I had yeah. no anticipation of winning that either. I remember going past Ian Keith and just being so excited that I passed Ian Keith. And then when I caught with Pavel and Eugenie, I was just, you know, I was just excited to be there. Yeah. So, and, and do you know what? Actually, I do still consider myself in that respect because I've never done that many races. I've not won that many races. Yeah. I certainly don't regard myself as an elite runner. Yeah. So if I ever get towards the front, I just get quite giddy, really. <laughs> um, but but, uh, but yeah, I've, I've 
yeah, it's been good. But I think it's good yeah. to be giddy. A lot of people would be running scared or maybe even think, wow, I've got some kind of imposter syndrome. So to embrace it like that, I think it's awesome. But yeah. what, you know, what attracts you, Mike, you mentioned there, Spine Challenges, a winter Bob Graham, a double solo Bob, and that's not even, you know, that's just touching the surface. It sounds like you prefer a horrible long days or multiple days out. Is that a fair, a fair assessment? <laughs> Oh, well, I said that I get giddy if I'm towards the front, but once you've won something, you get quite addicted to actually being at the front, don't you? <laughs> so I wouldn't say I necessarily enjoy running in gnarly weather more than I enjoy running in nice weather. But okay. the reality is, is that I'm not a particularly decent runner. Uh, and, the, and the conditions that slow down the decent runners <laughs> allow me to just kind of keep plodding along and get yeah. past them. Um, but yeah, there is something, I think, not necessarily at the time of running, but actually afterwards, that kind of, oh, pushing the boundaries and having managed something in severe conditions definitely does add that extra dimension when you've finished. I'm not so sure at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I was saying about the Wainwrights at the start, the Wainwrights was was pretty gnarly. Do you think you'll ever go back to that? Uh, so I did have an attempt at winter. Yeah. And, and I set off at the same time as James Gibson. We were like an hour apart from one another. Uh, and I think the fact that we were just running at the same time just absolutely did my head after a little while. I still had plenty in the legs. I yeah. just mentally lost it. Uh, and, of course, James carried on and finished, did a brilliant job. So he yeah. did really well. But he had to sit quite a bit of it out. So I was thinking of going back last winter, but there's always something else that you want to do, isn't there? So I don't know. But if I did go back, I'd, I'd go have a go at winter winter rides, yeah. It's amazing that, you know, you know exactly what's involved, these big, massive, long multiple days events, but then to still have the motivation and the energy to go again, I think uh, hats off to people. Sometimes I'll feel a bit damaged after a big, long race, and it's like, I don't know if I want to feel that pit pain all over again. Curious, you mentioned earlier you're a doctor. What's normal life look like for you, Tom? Working a 40, 50-hour week, uh, depending on how busy the week is, out of hours, nights, weekends. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm an anaesthetist half the time. The other half of the time, I'm the deputy medical director for our hospital. Okay. So both of those are pretty busy wow. uh, parts of work. And I actually, you know, I, I often reflect on you, talking about the resilience and getting into the longer stuff. I think definitely working nights and weekends and odd hours definitely does give you resilience. I, I, I said at the start, I'm old. It is true. So when it comes to work, I feel like I'm sort of the last of the dinosaurs, really. Because like medicine and training has changed completely from when I started. So yeah. when I first started as a junior doctor, I, it wasn't that uncommon to do a 54-hour shift. Um, oh. And so you'd really learn what it was to function, do the absolute necessary what you needed to do, and maintain a high standard whilst being tired. And I guess something about that still sits with you as you get older. Yeah, definitely. It seems quite common, doesn't it? Um, lots of various uh, medical professions, but they are very good at running uh, ultras. Could be vets or paramedics. Both Eddie and myself are, are parents and work and then fit in the hours. That's you've got a massively demanding job. How do you make the juggle work? My wife and I have also got five kids between us. Oh, um, but they're all. <laughs> what else is this going to go? We also have kennels. We've got twenty dogs, farmers, <laughs> camels, horses. I run a racing yard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they are all older. Uh, they're all older. So three of them have left home, and my two predominantly live with their mum. And actually, I would much rather spend more time with them than do more running, is the first thing I would say. But anyway, that's life, isn't it? Uh, so in terms of just of juggling that all, yeah, it's, it's a lot of hours. And I think one of the advantages I have is I have one of the world's nicest commutes. So I tip just over Ilkley Moor from home to Airedale Hospital. Uh, so I, I hardly ever drive the car, cycle in, or I'll run in if I've got enough time, run home if I've got enough time. You can just accumulate a few hours yeah. out doing that, can't you? Dogs always need taking out. Yep. Uh, and then, um, yeah, my wife is very understanding. So she does like a bit of running. And what we'll quite often do is we'll go somewhere nice on a weekend. Like, so we'll go to Malham, do a couple of hours together, go to a pub lunch in Malham, and then I'll run home from there. Yeah. Or if we're doing a faster run, she just doesn't really particularly mind if she does the hill once whilst I do it twice. Yeah, even yeah. Though all the walk, even though all the walkers think I'm a total idiot <laughs> doing laps. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we work well together. Oh. Sarah's also my, my support for the events. So when we have a holiday, 
a lot of our holidays are spent with me doing some kind of challenge and her driving a car around supporting yeah. and she changing my dirty holiday socks. Too? Would she be like, this is, uh, this is not a holiday? <laughs> She has to me a couple times recently. She really needs a holiday. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't. We're not calling this a holiday. That's not fair. <laughs> I need a proper holiday involving an aeroplane and a beach towel. You need to do your challenge at the beginning of the holiday, and then you can enjoy the week week with your feet up on the beach somewhere. Yeah. Share the details of the challenge. Why this challenge? And yeah, how did you come up with it? So I spent most of last year injured. I guess is the first thing to say. So I had got um, sciatica from a slip disc in January. And by April, May, um, I was essentially able to hill walk or fast pack, but I still couldn't really run for a couple of reasons. One is it hurt. Uh, and the second was I just was left with a bit of numbness in the right leg. So the right leg wouldn't really fire. So I was just sort of running with a limp, but it was okay speed walking. Yeah. So I thought, okay, well, I can do a bit of vert, but I can't really do any proper races. I plan to do the two Irish rounds uh, back to back, uh, which I sort of in, in a tribute to John Kelly's grand round uh, with the support of a few Irish friends I called the It'll Be Grand Round. Yeah. <laughs> so I did that cycling in between because cycling was also okay. Yeah. And that worked out really well. That went well. But whilst I was over there, there was uh, an Irish guy, Ricky, oh, I can't remember his surname now. I should be giving him a plug, shouldn't I? He had done um, 15 reps of Crow Patrick whilst I was out there to try and set a kind of new 24-hour vert total. And I looked at that vert total and I thought, yeah, it's a pretty decent total, but actually I reckon I could do more than that. Um, and then I kind of thought, right, well, let's see what the biggest vert total is in 24 hours. So I looked it up and I found like, you know, there quite a few people have got up to 40, 45,000 foot of ascent. And I was held all this plan to do 24 hours of vert. And then I found out that Aurelian Denand had done over 50,000 uh, during COVID because oh, yeah. he was just stuck in his backyard. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, no, I'm not going to catch that. Then we had the whole thing at work settling about COVID and all the problems with long COVID. And there was a, there was a lot of stuff going on. And it really made me think that actually what I could possibly do is go back to plan A and target Ricky's time, Ricky win, Ricky wins time, uh, and then uh, just see, just keep going from there and see what I could do. Uh, and I thought, well, what? And then I found out a bit more about Everesting. And I could see that people had done kind of double, triple, quad Everesting on a bike, but no one seemed to have really done that too much on foot. There'd been a double and a triple done, but no one had done a quad Everest on foot. Yeah. And I thought, you could just keep going endlessly on this. What would make a sensible end point? And of course, the iconic distance for a runner is the marathon distance, isn't it? So I thought, oh, why not do a vertical marathon? That would be really quite a good challenge. And I'd heard so many people who have long COVID saying, well, you know, actually doing a flight of stairs feels like doing a marathon to me. Yeah. Um, so I kind of thought, well, I could do it to raise some funds for long COVID. So those kind of two things stuck together. How many people do you think are out there with long COVID and maybe diagnosed or, or unaware of it? You know, it's, it's, we've probably all had COVID at least once and not even realised we've had it. So long COVID too, yeah, it's quite scary. I don't have that information at my fingertips, Gary, but it's, I think it's a lot more common than it's actually recorded. It's probably the first thing to say. Yeah. You know, there's still plenty. You know, two of our kids say they can't taste the food properly still. Yeah. And that is a variety of long COVID, just yeah. that lack of taste. And it, really, it does affect your quality of life, uh, you know, and in terms of the actual, you know, what people would think of as more proper long COVID, so like breathlessness or brain fog. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I know plenty of people have got both of those. It's pretty common uh, and l lesser degrees of it, very common. And what kind of, um, if somebody's suffering with any of these symptoms, what kind of support would they get from the charity? So the charity is partly kind of um, advocating for people and advocating for funds. Uh, so they would be trying to get local services set up or social support, but they also would be supporting people with, you know, things like around housing or other aspects if they're actually starting to struggle with the bills, could be in the putting them to points of financial contact, financial advice. Yeah. Um, but really, actually, just a point of contact and a point of, to talk and to share actually how you're feeling, I think, is probably the most important primary goal. Are you, I'm always curious with these things, are you quite a military planner when it comes to this kind of uh, challenge? Would you know your carbs per hour and all this and that? How do you how do you approach such a challenge, training-wise? No. no. Plant size, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I do it all on feel. Yeah. So I just know what kind of things I like to eat because I think actually knowing what you kind of will tolerate in your mouth and in your guts yeah. is more important than actually its exact calorie content. So I tend to stick to more savory things um, and only do the kind of sweet stuff right towards the end of a challenge. You've got to eat before you're hungry. 
So yeah. I'll know if I start to feel a bit, oh yeah, I just feel like I fancy something. I've got to make sure you put something in my mouth. Do you know, Ash, when, I, when other people ask me about long distance races, I give them really simple advice. Perhaps again, it's the, just the Yorkshireman thing. So I kind of say, if you're doing the spine race, let's say for an example, if you set off and you've got a four day race and you think to yourself, could I, moving at this pace, eat a pasty? <laughs> If the answer is no, then you're moving too fast. I yeah. think that should uh, generally be a good life lesson for anything. Can I eat exactly. a pasty while I'm doing this? If the answer is no, don't waste your time. <laughs> Slow down, yeah. <laughs> and for a 50 miler, if you're setting off and you think, could I eat uh, a chocolate bar? Yeah. And the answer is yeah. no, then you're going, you're going too fast. It's a good way of making sure you get food in and making sure that you pace yourself properly at the start, which, of course, that's what most people struggle with, both of those two things, isn't it? Yeah, I'm dreading is that the first day when I know everyone's going to go off really fast and I'm going to be like, this is way too fast. Why is everyone going so fast? And I'll be questioning myself and my pasty eating technique, but I'll check that with them. I'll say, I've had some insider knowledge. Can you eat a pasty right now? You're sweating, <laughs> middle-aged man. I don't think you can. So let's slow it down. Uh, can, I, can you tell us a little bit about the route that you chose to do the challenge, what you actually did to complete yeah. the elevation? Did you go up and down the same bit or did you do a circle? What was the planning behind the route? Uh, I tested out a few route variations and I soon realized that actually for your head, it was better to actually summit something. Because if you're yeah. going to do it often enough, what you could choose like the most ideal 100 foot of hill uh, with the perfect gradient. There's plenty of those around. Uh, but actually, that would get really tiring on the head, really tiring for your support because they'd be constantly seeing your ugly face coming back again every five seconds. Uh, and you just, I think you'd just get bored. Plus, there's just something a bit more iconic about doing a proper hill, isn't there? Uh, we run on Pendle Hill quite a lot. It's fairly local. Um, and a couple of friends had recommended it. it it's got like, some steps on the way up. So the other thing I realized is that um, it's quite a steep gradient. Having steps so you weren't on your toes the whole time was a big advantage because then your calves got a lot less tired. Yeah. And then there's sort of a runnable trod just next to the steps coming back down again. Oh, so I think if you're doing, an, you're doing an Everesting challenge, you might want a slightly shallower gradient so you could still run. Mm. Uh, but because I was going for such a long distance, and as I already said before, I wasn't really finding that I could run that easily. I went for a pretty steep gradient so I could kind of walk up and just kind of pot down. What was the stats of the hill then? What was the distance and the elevation? So it was 620 foot was the climb. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to remember how many, what, over what distance. I think it was about 27% the gradient. Oof. That is pretty steep, yeah. yeah. Did you use poles? Yes, from the start. Yeah. Absolutely. How long did each lap take you roughly? Uh, starting 20 minutes and then pushing out to over 30 minutes by the end. Not that big a difference, though, then in the total of... Um... And yeah, not, did you not get... negative splits, though. <laughs> it's all right, we'll forgive you. Did you get some funny comments from walkers that saw you 800 times going up and down? Oh, yeah, so... How many times uh, did people I, I... say you're not going up again as you were going up again? Actually, when you describe a vertical marathon, most people have absolutely no concept of what you're talking about. There is actually... A, I think vertical marathon is actually a term in, uh, like, sky skyscraper running i think where you run to the top of a skyscraper and back Ooh, down yeah. again just using all the flights of stairs but it's not actually a vertical marathon it's just going however high the skyscraper okay. is yeah. so that's one thing that confuses people the other thing is you know I, I said i was gonna yeah so i think it's 223 times i needed to do the hill in order to do the vertical marathon because it's like 138,000 foot of ascent um and you'd say to people People say, how many times have you done this now? Just, and I'd say, oh, I've been up about 80 times. And they go, well, what, today? And you'd be like, no, not today. I started yesterday. And they'd be like, oh. I just look a bit confused. They just couldn't quite put it into he's context. Confused. He's the local loony. He <laughs> Delirious. That's also possible. Maybe they thought I was confused. <laughs> it, it is hard to get your head around. And on the first day, it was I started on a weekend, and it was beautiful weather. And there were a lot of walkers out on the steps. So I was constantly going around people. But I also had two gates at the bottom to go through. Oh, no. Uh, and so, I, I, like, I spent half the first day, like, vaulting the gate because I didn't want to wait for people. And so I just said at the start of this, didn't I, that you should never set off too fast. So when yeah. you're just planning on doing a four-day Everesting challenge, you don't need, you need to be vaulting the gates, do you? But, you know. you got an audience. You away, yeah. don't you? Go <laughs> go away. How did yeah. you keep track of the laps? Uh, made a, a, just an A4 sheet with each Everest on 
uh, and just okay. got the support. There was always somebody at the bottom waiting for me. I think except maybe for a couple of hours. I'm all a bit disorientated about that. Yeah. But there was almost always somebody there just crossing them off for me. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have any sleep, any sit downs? Did you have like, right, I'm going to do three and then stop? Or was it sort of by feel? Yeah, no, but I know by feel what I can do on these things by now. So I don't usually don't bother trying to sleep the first night because I find you just don't because you're too, you're buzzing. So I, I skip sleeping the first night and then have a couple of hours the second night, uh, maybe up to four hours, depending on how you feel. And then usually just an hour to two hours each night after that. Is there a specific, a specific time in the night when you're like, this is my weakest point, this is when I need to sleep? Do you find like one or two o'clock in the morning or is it more early morning? Variable. As soon as the light's gone, you just start to feel it, don't you? Mm. And usually, you, you, yeah, you're right. But your biorhythms is normally one or two a.m. But your biorhythms are shot by day three or four of these mm. things, aren't they? You look at your watch so you, and it's seven p.m. and you're like, oh no, I'm not. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> you're, you're still pretty daylight sensitive though. Once the sun goes down, definitely more so. Any super highs, super lows throughout the challenge? Probably my the proudest achievement was obviously finishing it and doing the full vertical marathon. How did that actually last managed... lap feel when you were going up the last time? Were you like, I am incredible? Oh, really cool, actually. It was really yeah. great because despite the fact, I, can't, I don't, it was the middle of the night by then, I think it was about 2 a.m. There's still about 10, 12 people there and everybody came up for the last one and then everybody came down again. So it, was, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it wasn't the fastest, but it was definitely the best. Uh, how, yeah, it was really good. the quads on the way down? <laughs> Uh, my cars were struggling more than the quads. Okay, yeah. But the quads weren't that happy. No, yeah. they definitely did a bit of a stretch. A little stretch. Yeah, some, <laughs> and some, foam, from, some foam rolling, which was, I got straight into as soon as I'd finished. Oh. No, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I was get, oh, come on. I interrupted you then. You were going to tell me, sorry, about your highs and lows. Uh, yeah, so I think, so finishing and that last lap, definitely that was, one of, that was the biggest high. I think the second biggest high was probably beating Ricky Wynn's time in the, for the first 24 hours. So I, I, think, I, I think I only did about 300 foot more than he did. So in actual fact, part of the reason I did more than he did was just because I was doing a shorter hill and I was able to put in an extra rep where he couldn't. Um, but but also because he had just planned to do 24 hours and I was planning to do four days. Um, yeah. And I probably went a little bit too fast for that first 24 hours. Um, but it's just nice to, you know, have a series of goals. I think that's the thing. If you're going to try and plan to do 223 hill reps and actually setting out to say, okay, well, I've got a 24-hour vert target. I've got a double Everest, a triple Everest, a quad Everest target. I need to get times for all those. Uh, and I'd already noticed that although no one had done a quad, the double and triple times weren't that fast. So there were there were things to kind of target and beat all the way along. Did you have lots of people joining you, running up and down with you for bits of it, or was it mainly solo? So a core group of friends who supported me on a lot of stuff before, and they came out, and generally people that were local for this one. I think when, you, when you're doing a beautiful round in the Lake District, everyone wants to come and do some nice hills, but <laughs> not many people want to do a series of hill reps. Um, I, yeah, absolutely I, enough people and some really great friends, so the support's always crucial to these things, isn't it? Yeah, Riven Walsh, one of our patrons, um, we've asked about the plan, the route, but is there, did you have some way of calibrating i suppose you, uh, are you uh happy that the date is correct or do you just leave it up to garmin or whichever device you use oh yeah no that is a real good question because the uh, the on the everesting website i guess because they've got such a volume of people coming through it they're happy essentially for you to do any hill rep uh, and as long as it matches the data on Strava, then it matches and uh, the cumulative data just then adds up. But I was quite keen to make sure it was accurate because I know quite a few of the hill reps can be inaccurate and your watch is pretty inaccurate after you've done several. The um, segment I did on Strava says it's 632 foot, but I'm pretty confident it's more like 622. Um, and I set up the segment on Strava and actually I repeatedly, it came out as 650 to 700 when I was doing it with my watch, okay. which is really interesting. Oh. Um, but what I did was I didn't actually kind of get a surveyor out or anything. So yeah, <laughs> so you couldn't say it was super, super, super accurate. But what I did do is I zeroed my Garmin and got it to do an altimeter reading after zeroing at the bottom and then zeroed it at the top and got it to do an altimeter reading. And I did that until I had three identical readings, wow. both at the top and at the bottom. And once I was confident that the watch was reading the same every time, regardless of whether I've been up and down the hill, I was confident that was the height difference. Yeah. 
which what? came out of 622. Got a watch with a barometric altimeter in it. So I, I think that should be pretty accurate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sounds pretty good, pretty diligent. You mentioned, um, we, we, we skipped past, but you mentioned the Strava segment. Uh, you probably are local legend at least, but do you have the Strava segment? <laughs> <laughs> Not the fastest, no, ah. not at all. <laughs> uh, and I think my local legend, I think 90 Days is up now, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going it. back in a hurry. No, no, no. Now, have you run up it since? No, I haven't. No. <laughs> Although the full tour of Pendle Fell race was at the start of November, and I was really quite tempted to do that just for fun, but I was still a bit too broken by then. Yeah. How long did it take you to recover from that? It was one of my fastest recoveries after an ultra, interestingly. Maybe a, uh, a month before I felt fully recovered. Yeah. I think that was partly because um, I did something that suited me, but also partly because I'd had the sciatica. I spent quite a lot of the year doing much more strength and conditioning than I usually would. Mm. Uh, and then my recovery was much better, so I've kind of kept that on now. Do you think the fact you had access to nutrition and fluid as well whenever you wanted it, so you probably never got oh, yeah. like deeply dehydrated or... Yeah. Um, you were able to keep on top of that because I imagine some of the really long stuff you've done, that is so damaging is the dehydration, isn't it? And the hunger, if you get calorie deficits. I don't think I usually get there in all honest. <laughs> no, because I'm pretty good at fueling. With this challenge though, would 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 you be completely in control of the fueling or would you you know, take advice, someone go, Tom, you know, you need to eat something. I'm the boss when it comes to eating and drinking. I think that again, you know, I was with a group of people who know me really well. Yeah. So yeah. I think if someone comes along, actually doesn't know me well, they'll be trying to encourage you. Like, you know, people, you, you support a bob. Often you need to tell people when they need to eat, don't you? That is pretty common. Yeah. But the people who know me well know that I, I don't need that kind of support. <laughs> oh, I'm scared. My, my, nick, my nickname is Tommy Tutis. The glare then. I was like, <laughs> Dummy Tootie. <laughs> <laughs> we call Dougie Zinnis Dougie Double Dinners, but then he's posher than me, so he has dinner for his evening meal. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Can people still donate? Is there a place, um, is your Just Giving page still open? Where can people find it? It is still open, yep. And I can provide a link for that, no problem. That'd be brilliant. Thank yeah. you for talking Yeah, that. we'll pop the link onto our Facebook page and at the bottom of the show notes as yeah. well if you want to go and take a look over there. Right, I can't let you go, Tom. We've listened all about your challenge. Now you've got to give us something back. Anyone want some tips? I, I need some tips. I've got spine <laughs> in 10 days time. Help me. You're a winner. You can tell me everything. What would be your biggest tip for me? Start in the spine. Never done it before. I've never done that far before. What's the biggest tip? Don't try and win. <laughs> I've won what? Oh. <laughs> I've won once and DNF twice on the spine. Okay, tell me. So the only time I the only time I finished was the time I won it. Oh my god! Whereas I know plenty of people like Gary Chapman who comes out and supports me a lot, and I think Gary's got the most spine finishes. I can't remember how many he's done now. I think eight. So he's the man who really would give you good advice on this. And also, I think the years that have had most finishes on the spine have been the years with the worst weather. And I think the reason for that is because when they've stopped the course and pulled people off and they've been forced to rest, then they've had much more reserves for when they've carried on. So I think people don't, people set off too fast. They don't stop and sleep early enough. They don't rest early enough. Well, it's one of my biggest barriers at the moment is the fact that I want to be competitive, but I want to finish. And I think you almost have to make a deal with baby Jesus, don't you? That like, okay, I'm going to take the finish and the position will take care of itself. That's the sort of thing my husband would say to me. It'd be like, go for the finish and the position will come if you get yourself to the finish. Um, yeah. Where where do you sleep first normally when you do the spine? Where do you rest uh, first? I slept previously at Hawes. If I was going to do it again, I'd probably go to Middleton. Yeah, that's my... Hawes is just a bit too early. It's daylight. And that yeah. is one of the difficulties of the spine yeah. is sleeping. The checkpoints are so far apart. Mm. It's the first, like, after once you get to Middleton, the sleep probably get, you know, when you get to the checkpoints, you're going to rest. But getting yeah. your, getting yourself to Middleton, to me, it seems like getting yourself there without having too much sleep, but enough rest that you're not absolutely ruined, that you then can't yeah. come because then the race starts. Um, I, I've definitely seen a few people nodding at Tan Hill. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> so there are other opportunities to have a little nod. And yeah. I think there's a bunkhouse in between Sun Hill and Middleton as well. Yeah, and people say... That, that, that the owners leave open for spine runners who are going past. I so that, so that, that would be why I'd go from try from Horse to Middleton if I was going again. 
because there are options to just cover. You, if you don't, if you're not feeling it, you can stop and just go for half an hour. Yeah, and that's what, that's what, when you're really knackered, you can sleep anywhere, really, can't you? But some of the early checkpoints sleep. just too busy though to sleep. I don't know, not when I'm there. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, but I think that, I think that that has been a problem on European races that I've done. Definitely, yeah. When I did the Tour de Gion, the checkpoints were heaving and it was really difficult to sleep. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I've heard that about the Tour de Gion. Uh This week, yeah. I'm I'm about to pack my drop bag. Any top tips for what I should put in my drop bag that I'm going to see at every checkpoint? I think a decent hat is one of the best things you can have on the spine race. So one of the ones, those ones that comes down over your ears because and, and with a peaked brim that and so and also it's so much easier to take a hat and a buff off. So I usually have about four or five buffs on the go. Uh, and I try not to change my base layers too much because it takes ages, although, of course, you have to do that occasionally. Yeah. Um, and so I'll have, like, a couple of buffs around my neck, and then if I've got one under my head, under my hat, and then if it gets hot, boom, 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 you just take yeah. everything off and pocket it. Yeah. Yeah, I've um, been looking at the weather, and it's quite tricky because it actually looks, <clears> during the day, especially carrying the pack, you get a bit of a sweat on when it's, like, yeah. it looks like it's going to be, like, 7 to 10 degrees during the day. Yeah, exactly. Um, but then you don't want to be like, oh, take the pack off, take more layers off. Oh, now I'm cold because I've stopped. Buffs are great though, because like you say, you can just regulate yourself quite easy with a buff. I always like a zippy top too, so just to yeah, let, let sweat out. Yeah, <laughs> sweat yeah. out. And I don't take thick waterproofs. No, so I take two. I take two sets of thin waterproofs, two tops, two bottoms. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. I think. Uh, and so, if it gets really freezing, double layering your waterproofs is actually a lot warmer than a set of thick waterproofs. But if it's raining and fairly warm, you only need a single layer. Yeah, yeah. I have got that exact plan. I've got two mm. sets of waterproofs, and um, yeah, two sets of trousers, two sets of tops. You uh, had quite a good recovery after that challenge. Have you got anything planned for 23, 24 that you uh, can share with us? Mm. So um, I am on the waiting list for the Barclay Marathons at the moment. Are you allowed to say that? Yes, I believe I am allowed to say. I'm not allowed to say anything about the course or the details. No, okay. uh, and I, but I've been told by lots of people not to say that because it actually just adds a whole load of pressure if you have a place, isn't it? Yeah, it's fair. Um, it's fair. But at the moment, I'm first on the waiting list. Oh. So if anybody drops out, not wishing ill on anybody in the 40 people who are in, uh, then I should get a place. But at the moment, I don't have a place. And it's only 40 people, so I might not get a place. Yeah. Okay. But the reason that I decided to mention that is because actually – I feel quite privileged just to have got first on the waiting list. And yeah. if I do get a place and I go and I come last, I'll have felt absolutely no shame whatsoever. And if and if I don't get a place, I'd really quite fancy the idea of maybe do having a go at John Kelly's grand round or possibly combining John's grand round with my it'll be grand round and try to do it because I'd make a proper loop yeah. incorporating yeah. the Irish ones and do five rounds back to back. Oh. I'm not quite sure how feasible that is, but you've got to keep pushing the boundaries, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. got to keep pushing. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Ken, I'm not too sure if you can share this, but is there a, with Barclays, is, is there an application process? You have to write an application letter. Um, secret, Gary. Is it top secret? Is it? Sorry, I don't get any trouble. I'm saying nothing, Gary. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> going to ever apply for it. I'm not asking for anything. I know. I think I know five people doing Barclay Marathon. Probably can get you off that waiting list. <laughs> I wonder, yeah, do you know also it, it, what the stat is? I know with the normal race is quite high, the dropout um, entries to actually who turn up on the start line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so I, I think I know at least one person who's doing the spine is definitely in the Barclay first 40. So just be, if you can be really careless with your poles, Eddie, on the start line, then I'll be I know quite a few. I'm very happy to take anybody <laughs> out, really. <laughs> Love it, love it, love it. Oh well, Ooh. thank you, thank you. Oh, it's oh, can't say thank you. We've not done quick five, Gary. Got to do the quick five. Let's put right. the show. Are you ready? Actually, I've got one, two, three, four, five. There's more than five. Let's put it that way. Favorite trail or place to run, and this can be anywhere in the world. Pendle Hill. <laughs> not Pendle Hill. <laughs> well, that is a great place. Uh, I, I think. The uh, Tour de Gion is the best race that I've done in terms of scenery. Uh, that Italian side of the Alps is absolutely stunning, and I do love going and running there. 
Um, I've skied a few times in the Dolomites and always thought it's awesome and need to go back in the summer and run there as well. So Italy, full stop, great. But actually, Il Climor on my doorstep. I absolutely love it. I never get bored. (laughs) Favourite radio station? Oh, now you're aging me. These are really mean questions. Uh, (laughs) I think uh, we're the same age. It's it's fine. (laughs) Radio 6. Oh, Oh, come on. Let's... I've got to answer the question honestly. When it's not Radio 6, it's Radio 4, Gary. Oh, yeah. I'm not quite the Radio 4 yet. I'm still oh, I'm clinging on. Of, I love Let's get Radio serious. 4 in the morning. <laughs> the kids aren't up. I get both Radio 4 and love farmers. I love 6. I, I love six. spending the last 10 minutes talking politics, no? <laughs> <laughs> well, talking about politics. Star Wars, Marvel, James Bond, rom-com or a drama. What's your favourite genre out of those? I like the way Star Wars gives a genre in its own right. <laughs> it trumps all sci-fi. I didn't want to give you a sci-fi. Gary wants you to answer Star Wars because he's already. But, but, yeah, no, I do quite like a bit of sci-fi. I like a bit of nonsense or a bit of drama. Yeah, yeah. Not rom-com, I'm afraid. Sorry. Do you clean your shoes or do you leave them caked in mud? Oh, variable. Depends how tired I am. Usually try and clean, but sometimes they all just go in a pile. And then about two weeks later, you say, what's that smell? <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, generally clean. What's your favorite shoes at the moment? What are you running in? Oh, okay. So Scalper have got some good shoes out. Um, uh, Spin Ultra is a really nice shoe. Yeah. Um, the uh, Rebel has got some good grip on it as well. Uh, and I believe they're going to start making something with a much bigger lug, so suitable for the steeper Gnarly fells and hopefully for a Barclay next year. <laughs> Everywhere I look, Scarpa, they're doing an awesome job. Um, social media. Last movie you watched. Oh, that brilliant thing with Michelle Yeo. Everything, everywhere, all at once. I can't oh, remember yeah, what the title is. Yeah. It's something along those lines. That is a bit bonkers, wasn't yeah. it? It's, it's, uh... Genius, but bonkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It felt like four in the morning, day four of an ultra yeah. from start to finish. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need to watch it again, to be honest. I watched it once and I would probably had my head in my phone and trying to watch that at the same time. So maybe I didn't digest it all. But yeah, really good, really good. Every show we do an Instagram story when we promote the show. And I wrestle with what music I should use for this story, but you can help me out here, Tom. If you 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 can pick the you can pick the track. What what song would you like me to use on your Instagram story? Oh, really? Well, uh, I really like Hoppy Polla. Do you know? No, no, no. Hop, know Hoppy Polla. You don't no. know it. Yeah. Uh, it, it, <laughs> sing it. Don't sing it. No, what? No chance. <laughs> uh, it's it's the one that's used on David Attenborough's Planet Earth. Series as the theme music for that. Again? Hoppy Poller. H O P P I P O W L A. Okay. We can do that. I just think it's a beautiful piece of music and it's got a certain serenity about it that I really associate with running. It isn't necessarily the piece of music that I listen to all the time. Yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Okay. Make it so. Yeah. Doesn't work well on. You know, <laughs> I, I can't hear it. <laughs> I've got one last. I've got a geeky Star Wars question you for you. Know? So, apologies if you're not a massive Star Wars fan as such, but you, George Lucas, has invited you around his um, the Lucas Ranch, and you can pick one stormtrooper outfit. Would it be classic Star Wars stormtrooper? Empire Strikes Back, snow trooper, stormtrooper, uh, Return of the Jedi, speeder bike, stormtrooper. Who would you go for as a fancy dress? Oh, do you know what? So when I said I liked it that Star Wars had its own genre, I really meant it. I used to love running around splashing in puddles in my wellies, pretending that I was Luke Skywalker. Okay. You know, those boots that he wore. Yeah. Uh, and I'd have to go classic Stormtrooper. Classic Stormtrooper. Love yeah. it. Classic. That's it for me. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Thank you so much, Tom. Amazing congratulations on everything that you've achieved already. Um, good luck. Good luck. If you do get off that waiting list, please come back and tell us all yeah. the secrets that you're not supposed okay. to. We won't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah. okay. no, this is a private conversation just between three of us. Yeah? 100% private. Yeah. Private. Yeah. Private. Yeah. Private. Let's start with everything. And uh, huge congrats again on the challenge. And everybody pop over to his Just Giving page and just a little pound over there. Good luck to you on the spine. <laughs> Hope you smash it. Oh my goodness, vertical marathon and those stats, you know, it reminds me of 
spine <laughs> when right it's just so much time out on faith it's I'm quite, um, um, I'm quite inspired by those sort of challenges though that I feel in my future there is a challenge a personal challenge personal like, challenges I, yeah. yeah I really love those I'm watching this girl if anyone's interested I think it's tip to toes she's running across she's run across Australia now um, and she's running a marathon every day um, and I quite inspired by that sort of thing like um, I would, I've, I've often, I think she's just broken the world record. I think it was 137 marathons she's done. Would you be okay nicely. being the complete focus though, with all your crew and yeah, everything? Yeah, you'd have to be, yeah, of course we would. I'd love it. <laughs> <laughs> Kids would need to be a bit older, but I was looking at like, um, I've seen a few people do like the uh, schemo vertical 24 hours, how many ups and downs. Yeah. And I was like, I quite like to do that like here. And I wouldn't be worried about a world record or anything. I'd just be like our local piece that I go on all the time, 24 hours. How many times could you go up and down? Um, I wonder how other people feel like, like, do you need a race or can you motivate yourself? I like to be in the pack, I think it's. Uh, but saying that, no, well, with the Bob Graham. Um, I know Neil and I shared that day. Um, but yeah, you were. It's really weird because you know what? That was a wonderful day, and everyone was super positive in helping you out. So yeah, it was. Um, it was good too. I forgot about that. Tales from the Trails, it's it's evolving, Eddie. It's not it's not how I'd visualise it initially. Know you want, but Gary, you don't can't always get everything that you want. Like, <laughs> no, but I, you know what? I really like the way it's... I want you to do this. But everyone's like, we don't want to do this. We, we want to put to notes do. on Facebook. <laughs> but I like this. Um, you know, we go and kind of search some good news um, stories out there. And first one, I know Paul William Smith, and I've run quite a few times with Paul. And he's a run streaker. And my, I don't want to get any of this wrong, Paul. So hopefully, um, I'll just, we'll just copied and paste this from Facebook. So hopefully the facts are right. But 16 years of run every day. So that's since the 1st of January 20, 2007. Now that is a root resolution that got a bit out of hand, actually, looking at that. And 5,844 <laughs> 5, days. And I think I've seen a screen grab of uh, like a Garmin run streak club. And I think Paul's number two in the world. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Apologies if I've got that wrong. Um, but that is just amazing. And there's a whole bunch of um, run streakers out there. I see them on my social media and it's so admirable. I'm not too sure what Paul's stats are, if it has to be 5K or one mile. I know people have their own little limits for what for, for how they what they what they class as a run. But either way, 16 years running every day. And you'll know, you know, Paul does marathons too. It's not just like you rock up and do say 5K is one mile. He'll do marathon, so be carrying niggles, and yeah, it's it's so it's so admirable. And anyone who knows Paul on his social media, he sometimes has some interesting outfits too when he, when he does these milestone events. At least we also had an email from Richard Bulmer who had written uh, a newsletter for his local running club with um, 10 resolutions and he adapted it a little bit for you and I, Gary. I'm going to read a few of them, my favorite ones. I like the first one. First one. Get a legendary Gary selfie. Spot Gary from the podcast and politely ask if you can be a beautiful smiling face on a selfie and share on Facebook, WhatsApp, or any other newfangled social media channel. I like that. Okay, that's my resolution, Make it Gary. I'm gonna wanna, I want a selfie with you. <laughs> selfie at Middleton. As the kids say, selfie. Uh, set yourself a part run target. See if you can get a personal worst. Smell the roses as you pass them. Chat to a fellow runner and just enjoy Saturday morning running slower than you've ever run before. The other one I really liked, find a favorite recipe and cook as an after run treat. See if you've got any friends you can share it with you, especially Eddie or Gary. Well, invite your friends along for a run and then afterwards share some freshly baked cake or please just come around and eat my Christmas cake because I can't, Gary. I can't, maybe, I mean, honestly, I think it'll be fine for the spine. Talking about adding different options, I could just bring the Christmas cake. Christmas cake, that'll get you through it. And we did a Facebook poll too. I... Oh my gosh, Gary. Gary loves a Facebook poll. You've done so, I can't keep up did with too, it. did too, didn't I? I, I? Lisa said, don't do any more polls, Gary. Leave. <laughs> I love that Lisa said, stop it, Gary, you're a pest. You're a Facebook pest. So Gary put a poll on Facebook saying, what are people's A races? And um, I don't really know why, but it was a good idea because it gave us, it goes to show how many races there are now in England. 
England because lots of them are in, there's hardly any international races I guess as well a lot of the bigger international races the ballots haven't come out yet as well uh in total at the moment there's 59 races been added and there's a few people that um haven't added them as poll and have just commented below so it's probably a bit more than 59 biggest race guess what the biggest race is that our listeners are doing got to be legal and 50. Lakeland 50, 20% listeners doing Lakeland 50, 15% doing Lakeland 100. I reckon that's just your um, groupies, Gary. Yeah, selfies. (laughs) Selfies, 4% doing London Marathon. That inspired me a bit because I've actually got quite a few clients doing spring marathons, which um, uh, which is an I have uh, like a good percentage of my clients doing spring marathons. So I thought maybe we should do a marathon episode a bit later. Yeah. Training for a marathon, good marathon sessions, how you do the long run. So yeah, yeah. perhaps we'll do that as a um, a session in the not too distant future. So four do. percent doing London, five percent doing the sprint now. Over on the sprint, it's little old me. And the rest are all men. So come on, ladies. <laughs> who's listening? Who's doing the spine and wants to hold hands with me? <laughs> Up cold and sweat. <laughs> I know two ladies who are doing it. Or three in total. We so. do. They're just too busy to answer your silly poll, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but go up, pop over there. See the huge range of races that people are doing, and you might never know. You might see somebody that's doing the same race as you. You can make contact, uh, make a comment, and yeah. share perhaps any training tips, or if you've perhaps got any training tips for any of the races out there, you can look. But I love the range, the range that. People- oh wow, so very from a road marathon to a Brighton Trail marathon to. Races with just enormous distances. So really. we mocked you, but we enjoyed it, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the next thing that caught my eye, this caught my eye for a while, actually, and um, Eddie gave us a, gave me a nudge in the right direction. But yeah, Gary McKee, he has run a marathon every day of the year. And um, yeah, you just, just search his uh, Marathon Man 365 on Facebook. He's got his own Facebook group over there. I'm pretty sure he's still raising money if you'd like to go over there and support Gary. There's not enough Garys out there. So yeah. <laughs> it's I, great every Gary I've ever met, I've loved. So Gary McGee, <laughs> you're in my club. Well, I just can't imagine the whole, the, the mental, um, we talk, I've got a few potential things that will come up for races next year. And the big challenge for me, because they're so close together is can I mentally get myself up for them? And this guy's got himself up every day and bashed every out. Day. I don't, you know, I don't think it'd be the mental load for me. It'd be the time of like, how, like really the fitting in of running the marathon. Yeah. I guess so you must get so efficient. Your body must get so used to it. Like get up at six, you run the marathon. Presumably he's not running them fast, like between, mm. you know, he's he's not coming away from it broken every day. And then presumably he starts at six, he sort of finished before lunch. And then you sort of, I guess you can get on with real life. Maintenance, yeah. Up hopefully. to Tesco's. I mean, <laughs> that's, the, that's the biggest thing I'd ask him. It's like, what happened to the rest of your life? And You should reach you... out. And if anybody knows Gary, um, it'd be great to have a chat with him. The mindset. I'll be curious. I know it's, I kind of want to bring it on a downer, but how he's feeling now. It's like a whole year focused. Yeah, and the come down after these challenges. Imagine like, it's going to be the same when I finish this, the few weeks after the spying. Gary, you can be like, well, that's one of my questions, actually. Are you going to say anything today? <laughs> Just like burnt red cheeks, terrible spots, swollen tangles, the low. I remember when I picked Bryn, Bryn up, mind me saying this, when I picked Bryn up from Dragon's Back, the week, like he spent a week, the come down, the sweats, the hallucinations after that were real deal because he had to, he really pushed himself to finish that. And and after a week, I had to go, right, you've got to get out. You've got to get up and move your butt cheeks off this sofa and <laughs> get back into real life. You do but that yeah. where you wake yourself up at night. You like be re- oh, reenacting it. Running. Yeah. Still running. And you're like, oh, yeah. Oh. Right, come on, move on. Strava Club. Well done. Gary loves a Strava Club. Yeah. You just wait till I top those leaderboards in a few weeks. So 500 of us crushing it. Top of the charts this week with Calvin Nickerson. Oh, we took the clean sweep. That's a bit selfish, Calvin. Distance, time and elevation. Big numbers, 147 miles, 26 hours, 15 minutes of running and 15,800 feet of elevation gain. Doesn't matter whether you top the leaderboard, you're in the middle, <laughs> or you're just dragging along the bottom. We love having you there. Let's make ourselves feel better. Christmas, New Year's resolution. Go on, (laughs) say some good stuff. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, again, I popped over onto uh, Apple Podcasts and found some more five star reviews. But big thanks also, first of all, to Jonathan Zink, uh, The Real Big Sister 13, Dylan 13, Kevin Blow, Ski, My Thick, Mike Hall, TikTok 75, CD Daz, Helen at Revive Fitness, Colin at CM Staggerer, Biscuit 1771, and Colin. Colon, uh, <laughs> but all leaving reviews over there on Apple Podcast. And uh, you'll read a couple out actually. First one from Kendra Wedgwood. How have I missed this? I feel so late to the tea party. Awesome. Yeah, I was so... always welcome. Kettle. Yeah, always welcome. Yeah. I was so sad when you ended Runder Hills and stumbled on this from Strava. Wow. So that's. Oh my goodness, man. I'm so pleased about that. Uh, I'm so happy you guys are back. I so really relate to you, Eddie. Kids activities being busy. What a great podcast. Three more episodes to listen to, but I'm saving them for my runs as I love talking over music. And you are my people. So happy you made this podcast. Yes, I'm sad that when running is life, you need these podcasts. Ha ha. Kiss, kiss, kiss. And that really, you know, it struck a chord with me actually because. Kendra did. I know, I know Kendra. She listened to the old podcast and it really made me think, wow, there's probably quite a few people out there who did listen to the old podcast and are blissfully unaware, sorry, that we still continue. And so if you know somebody you think might like uh, a trail running podcast or you know somebody who uses the run of the hills and you just assume they're still listening to us and they might not be. So yeah, please, please, please share the podcast. It's, uh, share it on it's- your socials. Share it on your socials. I've got a couple of others to read out and I'm going to read them out because, you know, I'm feeling a bit low, a bit nervous about my um, athletic expectations. So the Livesey family, the band is back together. I wish we were a band, Gary. Yeah. If we were a band, what would you play? What would I play? What would I play? Uh, drums. Drums or lead guitar? Oh, a lead guitar. I love that. Not just any guitar. Lead guitar. Okay. All right. You've got to be vocal, surely. I, definitely. Lead vocals. I'm not in the background. Lead Would you vocals. have a, like an instrument, like a little yes. tambourine? Yes. So have a guitar as well. Yeah, All right. Okay. Tambourine. I like the idea of that. And I see our vibe as like folksy sort of good music. It's yeah. got a good beat. Um, there's a few ballads in there, but we've got some up-tempo numbers. And then, you know, late night band, we come out with the heavy rock. That's I'd like a bit of free reign to do like a Michael, Michael J. Fox, Back to the Future. Oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, my eldest child asked for a, a puffer gilet thing for Christmas. And then he was like, him and his friends were like, why are you wearing a life preserver right now? <laughs> the, the Back to the Future is the, the cool kids film at the moment. Which I thought oh, was I love it. Anyway, let's go back to the review. The band is back together. Loving this podcast, Eddie and Gary. Great format of friendly banter. Not so friendly today. Nerdy training stuff and relaxed chat with interesting guests. What more do we need from a podcast? Toots agree with that. Uh, one more. Come on, one more. Yeah. Yes, no, maybe. Ooh. UK trail culture right here. So glad Eddie and Gary are back podcasting. So are we. The band is back together. Like, share and subscribe and keep those listeners coming in. Right, well, you can't, can't get healthy. That's your number one aim this week. What else you got coming up, Gary? Yeah, well, like I said, hopefully today is today will be a gym, a couple of gym sessions, cross country Saturday. So there was definitely, well, I'll definitely be at cross country. Um, it's not Harry League, it's Sherman Cup. Sandbag, uh, sandbag, sandbag. <laughs> I started at the back, but then I felt really strong and I overtook everybody. And I said, well done, everyone. But, you know, I'm really Well, it's happy. a good court. It's a good format. The Sherman Cup, it is everybody on the start line together. It's not staggered, like um, <clears throat> slow, medium, fast packs. So that is good. But yeah, a bit of a false start last week with saying I was going to do some structured workout, but I just felt so poorly. I didn't think it was a good idea to do that. So shake this cold off. Do one or two quality sessions and the Sherman Cup. And yeah, but down the gym a couple of times. And I think really that is me as far as running's concerned. And yeah, back to work. How about yourself? Well, as I said, yeah, a bit more hiking around with the pack. And then the pack has got to be dismantled. I'm going to wash the pack as well. So it's fresh. So when I go past people, people come near me, they don't go, because you don't like, I've worn it hours and hours and hours. And it, it, 
So I'm going to give... wash my vest or waterproof jacket. They could be. No, oh, no, I never. No. So my waterproof jacket hasn't been washed. So I'm really sorry. Just going to have to. But, you know, within a couple of hours, everyone, we're all going to smell just bog and fear and death. So it's fine. So okay, I'm going to get, get start washing everything out. As I said, I've started laying out all the stuff. I've laid out. I've only got one more bit of kit to get. I've got it by. We have to have in our medical kit um, paracetamol. And so French, the French drugs. <laughs> I'm going to go into the pharmacy. Anyone that's ever been ill in France knows they love giving out drugs because you pay for everything. They're like, yeah. I'm going to go and explain to the pharmacist my race and go, what drugs can you give me that are going to help me? <laughs> Legal drugs, obs, a uh, bit of modium, bit of paracetamol, that sort of thing. Got to do that, the rest of it. And this week, I just have to sort out, you know, when they say, why don't more women do ultra? Blah, 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 blah. Oh my God, the mental load I've got to take on for going away for 10 days to sort out childcare, dog care, all the kids' activities, everything that they've got to do. Um, so the Bryn has a full-time job. He's not here during the day. So yeah. I've got to sort out the kids going to school. Who's going to take the dogs to school? Dogs <laughs> and the kids. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, someone's got to come and look after the dogs during the day. Uh, all the kids' activities, who's going to drop them off? Who's going to pick them up? Make sure that whatever they're doing, all the ski. Oh my gosh, it's so much to prepare. It's just too much. It's too much, Gary. So, got to do all that. And then, non running related, but I'm going on my birthday treat. And my running friends and I, with our our corresponding daughters, we are all going to the ballet to go and watch Swan Lake. Oh, wonderful. They gave me that as a birthday present and they did it specifically because they said it's the week before the before the spine. It's we're gonna take you on a lovely evening out. We're gonna watch ballet something completely different, take your mind off it. Get a frock on. Oh no. It's still in the mountains, Gary. Okay. Is, I'll be in the warm, I'll be in the thermals. But we're gonna, yeah, we're taking our little girls, so that will be lovely, a lovely little trip, little evening trip. You see, I'm not a hermit. I can go mm -hmm. out. I'm already a bit anxious that it doesn't start till eight, so I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'll be able to go and watch that. Watch wonderful, graceful people rather than just big thumping, muscly Eddie. <laughs> I th I've, I've never been to the uh, opera. I think that'll be great. It's not opera, it's ballet, Gary. Swan Lake. There's no one singing. There's no one doing any singing. No, there's no singing in Swan Just music and dancing. Matilda. Okay. If only it was. Thanks again to everybody who listens and follows the show. A couple of people asking where they can find bits and pieces from the show. Gary puts all the links at the bottom of the show. And we also have a LinkedIn tree if you're looking for other uh links and gary now has a some sort of code he sent me are you going to like run along with that code and get people to scan Big it t-shirt <laughs> scan <flag>. my t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Hey, have a great week, everybody, uh, and good luck to everyone uh, who's embarking on a New Year's resolution. But don't beat yourself up if you stumble. It's usually we're here not. For you. We've got, you know, whatever. The fact yeah. that this is winning. <laughs> good luck though, if you're doing this red uh, January. I know I mentioned earlier. I've kind of glossed over it uh, because I run every day. It's not such a big deal for me, but for some people, it is. It is a big deal. So yeah, best of luck to everyone who's doing that. Run well, run wise. Refuel with tea and coffee, and don't forget to like share and subscribe i'm eddie sutton and i'm gary thwaites and that was episode five five lisa that's four episodes you're gonna have yeah. to listen to of tea and trails mm -hmm.